Okay, guys, so I'm going to share this. This is one of our first sessions with Gage adding secondary obedience to protection. So in the past, we've just allowed him to be crazy, you know, complete commitment to the protection work and the obedience. Everything's been separate. And now today, I'm saying to him, okay, you're going to be doing both for me. We just did a little bit previously. Now this is a session where I'm really going to ask the most that I've ever asked up until this point. So right here, you can see me putting pressure on the collar, asking him for the heel. He comes to the heel and I'm rewarding him with a secondary reward. Now I say this is a secondary reward, right? Because the primary reward is of course the helper, right? Or the decoy. That's the thing that the dog, if you have any kind of decent dog, that's going to be the primary desire of the dog is to engage with, with the decoy. However, um, it's important I think when you're doing this in order to create a little bit more clarity for the dog that you um, allow him to switch between rewards. So there's the primary reward of, of the, the, the helper, as you can see here, just the barking, um, you know, attempts to bite and actual biting, as you see here. And then there's the secondary reward of the ball. So I have the ball also in the picture so that the dog understands that he takes the reward where I tell him. I tell him if he can engage with the helper, and I also tell him if he must take the ball. You'll also notice when he yes. takes the ball, I play a lot with the dog to reinforce that taking the ball is a good thing. If I just gave him the ball and then didn't do anything, I would actually be decreasing the value of the ball. Now, it's really important. A lot of people really struggle with control around the decoy. And control around the decoy is actually built before you ever do it in front of a decoy, right? So all my obedience, you'll notice if you ever watch my obedience training or if you take any courses, um, that I offer all my obedience, there's pressure involved in every aspect of it, okay? I do pressure, release, reward, some uh, Nepo post stuff, some stuff of my own kind of design, and all my, every stage of training, even with the puppies, I, I add some pressure to the picture because I know at some point my dog's going to be in a high state of arousal. And the big mistake a lot of people make with the pressure is they wait um, and use the pressure only to suppress the dog when he's out of control. What I do is I use the pressure to actually channel the drive of the dog into desired behavior. So I can make pressure on the dog without suppressing him. So what most people do when they're doing secondary obedience with the dog is they basically take the dog around the decoy for the first time and they start hammering the dog and be like, hey, you've got to do this. You've got to listen to me. Bang, bang, bang. And usually what they end up with is, is, is a very poor looking picture in terms of the obedience. And then the dog also loses power in the protection, right? If you do it properly, you're teaching the dog all along along the path, all along the way, how to deal with pressure productively, even when he's in a very high state of arousal. If you ever watch me um, do competition obedience, my dog is in an extremely high state of arousal at all times, regardless of whether or not a decoy is there. He has learned over many, many months to control himself and to channel himself in that state of mind. So now I add the decoy. As you can see, I'm not having much problems. This is literally... Probably the second session I've ever said, okay, now you've got to do some healing around the decoy. And this is the one I've done the most in. Previously, I just asked for, you know, some down, very, just a brief look at me. Now you can see here, I'm telling the decoy, crack the whip. I'm showing him, you must control yourself. You must be under control. And I'm making it clear for him, your reward, you're allowed to bark at the decoy. You're allowed to bite the decoy, but when I give it to you, just like you're allowed to take the ball, when I give it to you, you'll notice I don't hide the ball. Oftentimes the ball is right next to the dog. He could take it if he wants, but he understands that he must not. And the frustration of not being able to take the ball channels the drop. So here, for instance, when we show the dog the sleeve, you see that the dog is controlling himself in the mindset of prey. And when he's barking, I'm teaching him to come from that barking into um, prey-based behavior or, or to to use the frustration from the barking and actually channel that frustration um, into either a grip or into the obedience. Um, so you can see here some more of this type of work. And again, it's so important, guys. Like, you just can't take your dog out and do this. You have had to have set the stage properly. So like I said, I'm going to be doing an online course on this so you guys can kind of 
see how to set the stage. So you can do a lot of this work at home, and then you go in front of the decoy and it becomes very easy, just like this. I don't have to practice in front of a decoy 1,000 times in order to get this and bang away on my dog or drag my dog around. I don't have to do any of that stuff because my dog really understands very clearly the individual behaviors that I'm going to ask him to perform. And when I put pressure on him, it's actually going to increase his drive, make him more correct, right? Make him make him more flashy instead of create that suppression and, and the dog that looks just scared and confused and, and is viewing the decoy and the handler as, as an enemy, right? So this is what you can see here. I'm showing him, hey, you can transition from that barking, from the barking to the healing, from the healing to the barking, from the healing to the reward. And the dog is learning all these things and he's gonna be shown this now picture regularly. And the presence of the decoy, in fact, will actually ultimately make my obedience better because my dog's going to learn to channel all, just like the presence of the ball makes my dog's obedience better, the presence of the decoy will make my dog's obedience better. So, anyways, um, I'm going to open the dog up here. And I do this regularly, right? I open him, I let him go into that high level of emotion. I ask the decoy, hey, make him a little bit crazy. Show him the prey. From the prey, we put him into uh, obedience behavior. And then again, that transition to the grip, right? And it's really important. I know for him, he's a little uh, thrashy on the grips. That's something that needs to be worked on. Um, and we are working on it. But right now, that's not the goal of the session. So this is what a first or even second session will look like when I'm adding secondary control with a dog around um, the decoy. And it's really important to do this properly.